Well, good morning, and uh, welcome uh, to First Baptist. Uh, we're so thankful that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. Uh, we're thankful for those of you who gathered in person and those who are joining us uh, online via the balcony this morning, and uh, we pray that God uh, would use this morning to remind us uh, the hope that we have because we serve a God who saves. And uh, if you don't know what it means uh, to, to know Jesus, to be saved by Jesus, to have a relationship with Jesus, uh, then we pray um, that the Lord would show you uh, this morning what it means to be saved and how great uh, a treasure that he truly is and how much he loves you and how much he has done for you. Uh, I'm Pastor Matt, and uh, again, I want to welcome you. I want to extend a special welcome to any of our guests this morning. And we encourage you, if you haven't uh, filled out one of these connection cards already, uh, to take a moment and to fill one out. Uh, you should find one tucked into the seat in front of you. Uh, and uh, we'll follow up with you this week, uh, answer any questions you may have about our church, uh, see how uh, we can love and serve you in this time and uh, to help you get connected in. Uh, we also encourage you uh, to learn a little bit more about our church via our website or our Facebook page. And then uh, finally, we encourage you to uh, join a small group, and we'll be talking about that more uh, in today's sermon. Uh, but if you're not a part of a small group here at First Baptist, we encourage you to, to join one. Uh, that doesn't just uh, include our guests, that includes everyone. Uh, we would love for you uh, to grow in Christ in that way. And so you can either text the word GROW uh, to the number on your screen, um, or uh, all of our groups are back here in the Ministry Resource Center as well. Um, at this time, uh, let's share Christ's love uh, with those around us, and if you're joining us in the balcony, we encourage you to use this time uh, to encourage a fellow church member uh, as well. All right? Good morning. So for today's announcements, we have Operation Christmas Child, which we're doing our July collection. Everything you need to know will be found in your bulletin, like what we're collecting this month. And then our next announcement this morning is our monthly prayer meeting. <clears throat> that is being changed to the second week of July. And the next following months, it'll also stay on the second week. We found that there are much less conflicts the second week rather than the first week. So please join Jan and the group that comes and prays on Sunday evenings. And um, pray for our missionaries as they are um, serving our Lord in other countries and in our own country. And our last announcement, um, the Van Nuys family, which you guys want to raise your hands back there? They um, are going to open their home to join them on Sundays for a meal. Um, if you just want to stop and grab a sack lunch or bring something that you pick up and then join them at their house, their address can be found in the bulletin. And um, they'd love to have some fellowship with our congregation. So let's go back to praising our Lord this morning. Please stand.
Welcome, First Baptist Church. Today we'll be going through Philippians 3, verses 1 through 21. If you do not have a Bible wish with you and wish to follow along, feel free to grab one from the seat in front of you. If you do not own one, feel free to take this one home. If you happen to grab a large print version, we will be on page 1,165. If you grabbed a small print version, we will be on page 981. I'll give you a minute to turn there now. <clears throat> Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, 
If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, nor am I already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The word of the Lord. Well, this is uh, one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, and one that has brought me uh, some of the most joy uh, in my uh, study of God's Word. And so I just want to say up front, uh, not, to, not to gain sympathy or anything like that, uh, I pulled a muscle in my lower back uh, on Tuesday and uh, spent um, a good portion of this week uh, resting and laying flat on my back and still have dull pain, and depending on where my arms go or how far I bend over, I have a sharp pain in my back. And so as I'm preaching through this very joy-filled passage, if you see me start to wince or get uncomfortable, uh, it's not because I'm questioning what Paul is saying here. It's just uh, just what is going on uh, with my body. And so, uh, but I've actually just been praying that the Lord would just, even, even if it's just for these uh, 30, 40 minutes, would just uh, just numb all the pain, and I could preach uh, this passage with joy, preach it as passionately as I could, that I could move around as much as I want to. And so any prayer warriors among us, uh, just invite you to, to be praying for that uh, during this time, that the Lord's um, word and Paul's words here would be honored. So what is uh, the one thing that you and I are about? I would encourage you to ask someone that question this week about yourself. What is it that I'm about? What do you think they would say about you? Do you think they would say, you know, the one thing that I notice most about you is you're a hard worker? Or maybe they've seen you or heard you sing, and they would say, you know, it, it's, it's a great singer. That's the one thing that I know most about you is you're a great singer. Or maybe they see you around your kids, your grandkids, and they would say, man, you're just a great parent or a great grandparent or maybe a great aunt or uncle? Would they point out a hobby of yours? That the one thing that you are about is sports or motorcycles or books or on a day like today, maybe it's patriotism. Again, what is the one thing that you are about? As we continue our study of Philippians 3 today, Paul is going to point out the one thing that he is about. 
The thing that he desires more than anything else, the thing that he puts his most energy towards, and it's this, knowing Jesus. Not just knowing about Jesus, not just knowing some of the Bible stories about Jesus, not just even putting his trust in Jesus, but growing to know Jesus more and more and more. Paul says, that's the thing that I'm about more than anything else in this life. Would anyone say the same about us? That knowing Jesus is the thing that we are about. What would need to change in your life and in my life for that to be true? And let me ask another question. Do you and I even want that to be true of us? Would we much rather be known for something else other than knowing Jesus? Let's consider these questions as we study Philippians 3 today and continue to discover what a joyful life looks like. Join me in praying now. Father, we thank you for gathering us together today. And Father, on this day, we thank you for the freedoms we get to celebrate. Most importantly, the freedom that we have to worship you publicly. Father, it's a privilege that has come at a great cost to many lives. Uh, but Father, it's also a privilege that we ascribe wholly to you. We thank you that you are the God over all, that you're the Lord over all. But, Father, we also know that many of our brothers and sisters in Christ are gathering today, but privately, because they don't experience the same freedoms that we have. And so, Father, on this day, we pray for their courage. We pray for their continued faith in you in the midst of persecution. And, Father, in light of Philippians, we pray that you would give them joy in the midst of this persecution, that you would help them to know you more, just like you're going to help us to know you more today. Father, as we think through the one thing that we are about, Father, I think if most of us are humble, we would admit that many times it is not you. That we get excited about the things of this world. We get passionate about things of this world. We talk most about the things of this world. But Father, we pray this morning that you would show us that knowing you is the best thing. Not just knowing about you or just simply having salvation and going back to the things of this world. But Father, growing to know you more and more and more is the greatest treasure we could pursue in this life. Again, show that to us and use your word this morning to help us live it out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Paul starts out in verse 1 reminding this church in Philippi to rejoice in the Lord. Uh, there we, again, we see this word joy that is such a common theme in the book of Philippians. And we have been seeking to study Philippians to uh, see reasons to rejoice and to see what a joyful life in Christ looks like. And so then in verse 2, Paul starts out to warn the, Philippi, or the Philippians to look out for the dogs, the evildoers, those who mutilate the flesh. Uh, Paul here is referring to a people uh, with people group within the church in Philippi called the Judaizers. Uh, these were Jews who were willing to accept Jesus. They believed that Jesus really was the Messiah. But they also believed that you needed to keep the customs of the Jewish faith in order to be saved. And so you had to believe in Jesus. You had to be circumcised. You adhere to strict dietary laws. And you had to keep the commandments in the Old Testament in order to be saved. And not only were they believing this and trying to live this out, but they were insisting that every single other person also had to. And so even if you weren't born a Jew, even if you were a Greek, uh, a Gentile, a Roman, whatever you were, and you came to know Christ, they insisted, oh, that's great that you put your faith in Jesus. You also need to get circumcised. You need to start eating these foods and avoiding these foods, and you need to start obeying uh, the Old Testament law. And we see this dispute taking place in Acts 15, where these Judaizers, again, are insisting that everyone else has to adhere to these rules. And the leaders of the church get together, and those included Paul and Barnabas and James and Peter. And they discern the matter from the Lord. And they walked away saying, hey, this 
Uh, it is important that we believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that we believe the gospel. And all these other things, they're good things, but they are not a part of the gospel. They are different than the gospel that Jesus taught his disciples. The gospel message is that we need to put our faith in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. And so Paul warns the church in Philippi about these Judaizers. He calls them dogs, all right? And this is not a friendly term. Many of us think that, uh, you know, we, we think of dogs as being these really cute animals that we have as pets. And so, oh, that's, that's just really friendly of Paul to call them dogs. Uh, dogs at this time, uh, no one had them as household pets. They were not cute. They were nasty. They were unclean. They bit people. Uh, they roamed around uh, in the streets. They were dangerous, and so Paul tells the Philippians, these Judaizers, they're dogs, they're evil. They are preaching and teaching a different gospel than the one that we passed on to you, a different gospel than the one that Jesus taught us, a different gospel than the one that will truly save you. Paul says in verse 3, on the contrary, we are the circumcision, meaning we are the family of God who put our trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, who worship by the Spirit and glory in Jesus. And that brings us to our first point this morning. For us today, let us put our full confidence in Jesus Christ. That's 100% of our confidence in Jesus Christ for our salvation, not in the flesh. Again, let us put our full confidence in Jesus Christ for our salvation, not in the flesh. These Judaizers, again, were putting some confidence in Jesus, but then also putting some confidence in the fact that they were circumcised, and some confidence in their dietary laws, and some confidence in their obedience to the law. And if they were to stand before the Lord, and the Lord were to say, okay, it's judgment day. Are you saved or not? Yes, because I believed in Jesus, and I was circumcised, and I adhered to these laws, and I didn't eat these foods, and I did eat these foods. They're putting some confidence in Jesus and some confidence in the flesh. And Paul says, put all of your confidence in the flesh. But just in case the church in Philippi missed the point, and just in case you and I missed the point today, Paul goes on to give seven reasons that he had to put confidence in the flesh. He says, they're boasting about all these reasons that they should be saved and Paul's going to say, guess what? I got more. But Paul is also going to say, but none of those are reasons to boast. None of those reasons give me confidence that I will be saved someday. And so here are seven things for us not to put our confidence in, church. First is a ritual. Paul says that he was circumcised on the eighth day, uh, which was done just as the law said it should be done. Yet he put no confidence in it. And so if we are tempted to put our confidence in an infant baptism or a confirmation or the fact that we attended lots of membership meetings, Paul says, don't put your confidence in a ritual. It won't save you. Secondly, Paul says that he was of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. So he's pointing out his ethnicity here. And he says, I put no confidence in that. Even though I can trace my lineage to Abraham, I'm putting no confidence in it. And this one's probably a little bit awkward to apply for us, but if there happens to be any ethnic Jews that are part of our church this morning, we're thankful you gathered here, put no confidence in the fact that you are an ethnic Jew when it comes to your salvation. It's of no value to you. Thirdly, Paul talks about your family tree. Paul says that he was of the tribe of Benjamin, which was one of the more respected tribes in Israel. It's the tribe, uh, the area that they were given in the book of Joshua is where Jerusalem lo uh, was located. And when the kingdom split uh, into the, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, Benjamin was one of two kingdoms that stayed faithful to David. And so to be from the tribe of Benjamin was of high honor. And yet Paul says, I put zero confidence for salvation in it. And likewise, there may be many of us that may be 
a member of a well-known uh, or well-respected family here in Muscatine. You may want to hold on to that and say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the nephew, I'm, I'm the grandson, I'm the granddaughter of this person here. You, you probably have heard of them. They have their name on a few buildings. Um, or if any of you are tempted to hold on to the fact that your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents were someone who built this church or uh, we're a faithful teacher in this church, or we're a leader in this church, or uh, maybe you're part of one of the larger families in this church, and you think that you have something to be gained from that. Paul says, put no confidence in it. It means nothing in regards to your salvation. Next, Paul addresses religion. Paul says he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, meaning he didn't abandon the Jewish faith when the Greeks took over. He didn't abandon the Jewish culture when the Greeks took over. He stayed religious. And a lot of us, as we share the gospel, we hear about people who say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm religious, or I believe in God, or I'm a spiritual person. They're putting their confidence in their religion. And Paul says that is of no value to you in regards to your salvation. Put no confidence in it. Next is rule keeping. Paul says, in regards to the law, I was a Pharisee, meaning he kept the extra rules that were made. The Pharisees, remember, there's God's law, and then they put a fence around God's law, so they added rules to make sure that no one actually broke the real rules. And Paul says, I even kept those extra rules. He was morally superior to almost everyone else, and he says, I put no confidence in it. I'm not basing my salvation on that. And likewise, there may be many of us who would like to say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping all the extra rules. Pastor tells me to do something, I do it. Teacher tells me to do something, I do it. I read the Bible, I do it. Paul says, put no confidence in it. Paul says, put no confidence in your zeal or your passion he says he was a persecutor of the church as for zeal, meaning that Paul was so passionate about Judaism, he believed that so much that these were the people of God, and in order to be saved, you had to be a Jew, and you had to wait on the Messiah, that when the Christians came and said, the Messiah has come, and you need to follow Jesus, Paul was like, no, this doesn't seem like the gospel that I heard. This doesn't seem like the Bible that I was taught. And so he persecuted them in order to preserve the family of God. And later he realized what a mistake that was. But he says, I was passionate about God's family. I was passionate about what I was taught as a kid. And likewise, you and I may want to rely on our passion. You know what? I'm, I'm a passionate worshiper. I'm passionate for missions. Or I'm passionate for kids' ministry. And so I must be saved. Paul says, your passion does not mean anything when it comes to salvation. Finally, Paul says, put no confidence in your obedience to the law. He says that as to righteousness under the law, he was blameless. Uh, he's not claiming sinless perfection here, but rather stating, I, I lived a pretty good life. If you were to go through most of God's laws, I would have kept most of them for a majority of the time. And yet he put no confidence in it. And neither should you and I put our confidence in the Lord that when we stand before the throne, that someday we'll be able to say, you know what? There's all these people. A majority of the world has not cared about keeping God's law at all. They don't care if they lie. They don't care if they curse. They don't care if they steal. They don't care if they covet. But I've tried to keep God's law, and so I'm better than most. Paul says, if that is where your hope is, if that is where your faith is, you're not saved. Put no confidence in your obedience to the law. Paul says in verse 7 that whatever gain he had, whatever reason he had for confidence, he counts it as loss for the sake of Christ. That great list of Paul's accomplishments, he's saying, it means nothing. It's a loss. And if you and I are going through this list and say, you know, I, I actually have number one to my credit and number three and number five and... You know, I'm pretty passionate about things, number six. And we start gathering a boastful heart that wants to say, you know what, I feel pretty confident that, that on the day that I stand before the throne, I can list off four or five of those boxes. I'm feeling pretty good. 
Paul says we should actually be looking at all those things and saying, that's a loss. If that's what I'm counting on, I should consider that a loss for the sake of Christ. That we should be looking at that list and say, I will absolutely, positively put no confidence in any of those things. I will put 100% of my confidence in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. And in fact, if I lose all of those things, if my family rejects me and I disregard my baptism as an infant and, and I'm less passionate about stuff. I will lose all of those things if I could gain Christ and to realize I just need to trust in Jesus, that Jesus has done everything that I need for salvation. The last verse of how deep the Father's love says this. It says, I will not boast in anything, anything, None of that list that we just went through. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. May you and I likewise put all of our confidence, all of our hope, all of our boasting in Jesus Christ alone. And if you have yet to do that, if you've been trusting in that list that we just put forth, I just want to give you time this morning. To put your 100% confidence in Jesus Christ alone. There are many of us that we, we, okay, I believe in Jesus and I trust Jesus, but I'm kind of 80% sure that Jesus may be the way, the truth, and the life. And so I'm going to put my other 20% confidence in how I live, and I'm going to make sure that I go to church, and I'm going to make sure that I give, and I'm going to make sure that I follow the rules, and I'm going to make sure that I'm passionate about these things, and I'm going to make sure that I serve, because I just, I don't want to go to hell, and so I'm going to put 20% of my confidence in my own works, in my own flesh. And if that's you, this morning, put 100% of your confidence in Jesus. Put your full trust in Jesus. Believe that Jesus has truly done all the work that you ever need to be righteous. He will cover you in his righteousness and his good works. He will take away your sin. There's nothing you can do to take away your sin. There's nothing you can do to be good enough to earn salvation. You need Jesus 100% in order to be saved. So put your trust in Jesus 100% to be saved. Paul goes on in verse 8 to say that he counts everything as a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. How many of you have uh, boxes around your house uh, or maybe you have display cases uh, with some of your accomplishments, either from when you were a kid uh, middle school, high school, maybe college, uh, maybe even as an adult. How many of you guys have boxes like that? All right. So maybe you have uh, papers that you wrote uh, that you got good grades on or tests that you got good grades on. Uh, maybe you competed in an event and so you got a medal or a ribbon or a trophy. Um, maybe there is some artwork uh, that you did and so that's displayed on the wall. Um, maybe you have your diploma or your degree uh, displayed somewhere. Paul says in verse 8, if he were to stack up all of his accomplishments, all these boxes of these accomplishments, all the things that he's done well, all of his achievements, the greatest parts of his life, the best memories even. How many of you guys have picture albums of some of your best memories, family vacations? Paul says, if I stack all of those up, and then on the other side I put knowing Jesus Christ. If I consider all the joy and all the pride from all these moments and every good thing that anyone has ever said about me and all the love that I've experienced as I've enjoyed these moments with people and I compare it to knowing Jesus, knowing Jesus is better. Knowing Jesus has brought me more joy. Knowing Jesus is the greatest treasure of all. In fact, he says, it's not even close. Knowing Jesus, and again, this is not just knowing about him, but having a relationship with Jesus, and knowing Jesus more and more and more far surpasses any other reason to boast or brag in this life. I think it, many of us, if, if we admit it, there have been moments as we think about our accomplishments, we, we like to talk about that with other people. 
you know, hey, yeah, back in back in high school, you know, I was I was a pretty good singer. You know, our 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 choir like won some awards, or maybe I was a good athlete, won won a few races, or um, you know, maybe as an adult, you know, I, I'm pretty good bowler, you know, and uh, won, won this competition. Uh, we like to boast about those things. Or, or our family, uh, we like to post pictures of vacations and great times we have with our family. Many of you will probably post pictures today of the times that you spend with your family. We like to boast about those things. And Paul says, those things are not worth boasting about. The only thing that is worth boasting about is that you know Jesus Christ. You may have great kids or great friends or great friends but, or a great marriage, but knowing Jesus far surpasses it. You may have a great job. You may have tons of income, but knowing Jesus far surpasses it. You may have a bright future ahead of you, or as you look back on your past, you may say, man, I've lived a great life, but knowing Jesus far surpasses it. In fact, Paul says he counts all of those other things, all of his achievements, all of his reasons to boast, all of his memories, every other treasure that he would consider in this life, he counts them as rubbish compared to knowing and gaining Christ for salvation. The word rubbish here is a vulgar word for animal poop. So imagine this. You guys know that there are people that come around uh, and if you have animals, they, they come to your backyard, and they're willing to pick up all of your animals' poop in your backyard. All right? So imagine they come to your house, and you have animals, and there's poop in your backyard, and they gather up all the poop, and they put it in a box, and they write your name on it. And they set it on your counter, and they leave. Paul says all of your memories, all of your achievements, all of your accomplishments are worth that box of poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. That's what those things are worth. All of those things that we boast about and invest our life and pursue and desire and covet are worth poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Jesus is so great, so valuable, so wonderfully magnificent that everything else is like dung compared to him. And therefore, knowing this to be true about Jesus, knowing Jesus to be his greatest treasure, Paul says, I want to be found in Jesus. I want to have a righteousness not of my own works, but that which comes by putting my faith in Jesus. Again, Paul is alluding to the fact that when we stand before God, because of what Jesus has done for us, it will not only be as if we have not sinned because Jesus has taken our sin away, but it will be as if we've always obeyed because Jesus will clothe us in his righteousness. He will credit all of his good works to our account. Paul says, that's the righteousness that I want. That's the righteousness that I need in order to be saved. And so I'm putting my trust in Jesus. And I'm aiming to know Jesus more and more and more. He says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and to share in his sufferings and become like him in his death, by, that by any means possible I may attain resurrection from the dead. He says, whatever it takes for me to know Jesus more, I'm willing to take it on. Whatever the cost, whatever the sufferings that come my way, so long as I get to experience the resurrection, so long as I get to receive eternal life, so long as I get to gain this treasure that is Jesus Christ, count me in. Whatever it takes. Paul says everything else in this life. It's poop. It's poop compared to knowing Jesus. And that brings us to our next point. That there is no greater joy in this life than truly knowing Jesus. Again, there is no greater joy in this life than truly knowing Jesus. Many of us have pursued so many other things in this life for joy. Whether it's uh, sports, whether it's achievement, whether it's a job, whether it's relationships. And we often find those things don't satisfy us. And the reason is because there's a greater joy in this life, a greater joy that we are meant to live for. And it's knowing Jesus. Nothing on earth compares to knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Not one thing. Church, do we really believe that to be true? I don't mean do we acknowledge that with our minds. Are, are we willing to give consent to that? Yes, I, I believe it's true. Yes, Paul writes it in Philippians. Yes, it's in the Bible. The Bible is true. Yes, the pastor's saying it this morning. It must be true. I mean, does it 
do we believe it here? When we go forth here, are we going to actually live that out? Are we going to actually say, hey, everything else that I wanted to do today, it's more important that I know Jesus more because he is a greater treasure than all my other plans, all my other pursuits that I had for today. Do we truly believe that everything else in this life that we find joy in is poop compared to Christ? <laughs> Forgive me for a moment here, but I just want to drive this home. Sports are poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Music is poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Food, great food, is poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Family celebrations are poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Hobbies are poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Living in America is poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Retirement is poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Even our families and our loved ones are poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. Do we believe that, church? And I don't think that many of us do. And I'm, I'm throwing myself in this because there are a lot of things that I chase after in this world too that are poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. If we really believe this, there wouldn't be one of us that hesitates on a Sunday morning to gather together with our church and to worship together, to know Christ more because we would know everything else I would choose to invest a Sunday morning in is poop compared to the opportunity to be here to know Christ more. If we believe this to be true, we would stop prioritizing kids' sports and kids' activities over knowing Jesus because we would realize we are teaching our kids to value poop instead of knowing Jesus Christ. And so we would say to our kids, it is important for us to worship together. It is important for you to be in kids' church. It's important for you to be in youth group. It's important for us to do family devotions because the most important thing in your life is to know Jesus. And if we believe this to be true, then every single person here in this church would be growing in a group because we believe <laughs> that knowing Jesus more and more and more and more and more is the greatest treasure. It doesn't matter if you're growing in your personal devotion time. You would see, I want to know Jesus more. And so I'm going to grow to know him more with other people. If we truly believe this, all of our Bibles would be worn and marked up from use because it would be a joy instead of a burden for us to read God's Word and to know Jesus more. If we truly believe this, we won't be concerned with things such as money and popularity and the state of the world we live in because we already have the greatest treasure in this world in Jesus Christ. Again, do we truly believe this, First Baptist? God, help our unbelief. Help all of us to see your surpassing work. Help us to see everything that we are losing when we choose things over you. May God help all of us to not teach our kids and to not teach our fellow church members to value poop instead of knowing Jesus. Isaac Watson, Lowell Mason, wrote the song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, and the first couple verses go like this. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Where every realm of nature mine, my gift was still be far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And it's this last line that Paul now dives into in verses 12 through 21. That since Jesus is our greatest treasure, since knowing Jesus is worth far more than anything else, since everything else is worth losing compared to Jesus Christ, Jesus now demands our soul, our lives, our all. But Paul acknowledges, I haven't already obtained this. I'm not already perfect. <laughs> and yes, you read that right. Paul, one of the greatest preachers of all, or one of the greatest teachers of all time, one of the greatest writers of all time, one of the greatest church planters and evangelists of all time, does not see himself as perfect or as having arrived already. And I think, for a moment, I think a lot of us would agree with Paul here. We would acknowledge, you know, I'm, I know I'm not perfect either. We know that we don't always desire to gather to worship together. We know that our prayer life is not always consistent. We know that there are times that we don't always love and serve others well. We know that there are times that we get home and everything that we've learned here gets lost and we become hot-headed and impatient and frustrated with others. 
we realize we're not perfect. But many of us follow that up with this phrase, but nobody else is either. And usually what we mean by that is, it's okay. It's okay that I'm not perfect. It's okay that I'm not striving to grow. It's okay because I'm still better than most. We think it's okay to be imperfect because everyone else is imperfect as well. It's okay to half-heartedly worship Jesus. It's okay to keep pursuing all of these worthless things because other people are too. But not Paul. Now Paul says, I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. What is Paul's reason for growing in Christ more? Because Jesus Christ has made him his own. Because Jesus Christ has saved him. Because Jesus Christ has delivered him from sin and death and slavery. And Jesus brought him near and gave him eternal life. And Paul says, because the gospel is good news to me, I'm now going to live in light of the gospel. I'm going to press on. I'm going to keep living for Jesus. And he goes on in verse 13 to say what this pressing on looks like. It means forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Paul says to us, again, none of us have been perfect. There have been things that we have cherished and pursued and boasted about other than Jesus. But Paul says, forget the past. Today is a new day. Today's a new opportunity to know Jesus more, to grow in Jesus, to run after Jesus. But I think Paul's message also applies to those who in this church who have been running the race well and have been pressing on and have been seeking to know Christ more and more because it's really easy for you to get complacent. And I say, oh man, we're going through this book again. I've, I've, this is probably my third time going through this book. I've, I've read through my Bible every single year and I've had this faithful prayer life and, and every time I've joined a group, you know, pastors asked to join a group, I've joined a group and I've grown and grown and grown and grown and how much more can I grow? And, and you know, I've, I know Jesus. And Paul says, forget that. <laughs> Keep pressing on. Keep knowing Jesus more. Keep believing Jesus far surpasses any other treasure, anything else you could do in this life. You still have room to grow. Keep straining forward. He says, I'm going to press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, even though Paul probably knows more about Jesus than what anyone else in, in this church will ever know about Jesus, Paul says, I'm keeping on. I'm, keep, I'm going to keep pressing on. I'm going to win the prize. And what is the prize? It's the same thing that Paul has been talking about to this point. It's the joy of knowing Jesus. Paul says, if I put all my efforts, all my labors, all my time, all my energy to know Jesus more, I will have won the prize because that in and of itself is the joy that is unlike anything other. That in and of itself is the treasure unlike anything other. I don't look back at all the stuff that I missed out in this life, all the stuff that people talk about, all the stuff that people treasure, because I know the joy that comes with knowing Jesus more. And it's worth it. He says, it's the one thing I do. It's the one thing that Paul is about, is knowing Jesus. That's the only prize worth living for. And church, it's the only thing for us that is worth living for. It's the thing that brings us the most joy. So Paul says, my life's ambition is now to know Christ more and more and more and more and more because Jesus has saved me. And that brings us to our final point. That when we believe that knowing Jesus is our greatest joy, knowing him more becomes the one thing we are about. Again, when we believe that knowing Jesus is our greatest joy, knowing him more becomes the one thing we are about. So long as you and I are convinced of this lie by the enemy that all the treasures and all the accomplishments and all the achievements and the things of this world are where our greatest joy are, we are going to keep living for those things, keep pursuing those things, keep coveting those things. 
But the moment that you and I actually believe the truth that Jesus is our greatest joy, that Jesus is our greatest treasure, then the one thing that we become about is knowing Jesus more and more and more and more. And it doesn't matter what that means. It doesn't matter what that costs. We aim to know Jesus more. Again, is that the one thing you and I are about? Is that the thing that people would notice the most about us? That Jesus is our greatest treasure. If not, Paul encourages us in verse 17 to imitate those who are an example to us. Find someone in this church that aspires to know Jesus above anything else. Follow them. Imitate them. Grow with them. Paul points out in the next two verses, there are many people in this life that we're going to encounter that treasure other things. People that we are probably following, people that we are seeking to be like. Paul says they set their mind on earthly things and earthly treasures, but he says our citizenship is in heaven. Because we know Jesus, we should aspire something different. We should pursue something different. We should aim to know Jesus more. He should be our greatest treasure. Jesus is the one who will bring us with him to, glor to heaven. He will glorify our bodies. He will bring everything under our rule. Everything else that we treasured in this life will fade away. It will pass. It will burn up. Jesus is the one thing that will last. And so aim to know him more. So to help us do that, let me close by encouraging us to make two changes. And then we have a bonus one. But first... What step do I need to take to know Christ more? As you think about, I, I, I want to know Jesus more. I'm convinced that Jesus is my treasure. What, what's the one step that you need to take to know Jesus more? Maybe that's becoming a part of a group here. Maybe that's being more consistent with reading your Bible daily. Maybe that's growing in your prayer life. Maybe that's spending time with another believer. What step do you need to take to know Christ more? I'm going to venture to say that every single one of you here know what that is. You know what it is. You know the step that you need to take to know Jesus more. And secondly, what sin, habit, or activity, a.k.a. poop, do I need to get rid of in order to take this step? And my guess is you probably already know what that is too. When you say, I want to read my Bible daily, you know what gets in the way of you doing that. When the invitation goes out to grow in a group, you know what gets in the way of doing that. When you want to be faithful in your prayer life, you know what gets in the way of doing that. And again, all those things are poop compared to knowing Jesus more, church. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. Believe God's word today that Jesus is your greatest treasure, that this is worth more. This is where your joy is found. This is where your treasure is found. This is where your hope is found. And finally, a bonus to parents. What steps do you need to take to help your kids know Christ more? What habits have you set up in your family that are keeping your kids from knowing Christ more? What things are you teaching them to value or treasure instead of Jesus? So what does it look like for you to help your kids to know Jesus more and more and more? Again, Jesus is our greatest treasure, and there is no joy greater than knowing him more. And so may you and I take the steps we need to know him more, and let's get rid of everything that gets in the way of joyful knowledge of Jesus. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, what a joy and privilege it is to know you. And Father, I, I know many here believe that to be true prior to studying Philippians 3, but Father, I, I pray that all of us would know it to be even more true now. And I, Father, I pray that moving forward in the days and weeks and months to come, that each of us would see how much greater you truly are 
than the things of this world, the things that we cherish, the things that we pursue. That those things really are poop compared to knowing Jesus, to growing in Jesus, to becoming more like Jesus. So, Father, help us to get rid of the things that are standing in the way of knowing Jesus more and help us to take the steps that we need to take. Help us to believe and to help others see as well that Jesus is our greatest treasure. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
we have seen today that there is no greater joy than knowing Jesus. And so my prayer for us all this week is that we would just have a wonderful, joy-filled week of knowing Jesus more and more and more and more. You are sent, First Baptist. Let's go live in light of the gospel.